Hello. If you've been missing top quality sport and you're in need of a football fix, well, you're in the right place. Because over the next three hours, we are going to revisit one of the most iconic moments in English sport, a time when football really did come home. And welcome to Final Replay 66, where we transport ourselves back to the 30th of July, 1966. 32.3 million people crowded round their TV sets to watch that iconic final at Wembley Stadium. And we are going to relive their memories over the next few hours, as well as hearing from a few members of Sir Alf Ramsey's squad. And first up, a man who, well, I don't want to spoil the result, but you could say he was very much the man of the moment on that 30th of July final. He is, of course, Sir Jeff Hurst. Good afternoon, Sir Jeff. Fantastic to be able to talk to you. It's 54 years ago, but I'm sure the memories come flooding back for you. How many times have you actually watched the final back in its entirety? Uh, quite a few times, but in terms of the, the memories, they, they will never, ever go away. And people constantly remind me uh, almost daily of, of the great day, uh, where they were and, and what they were doing. So, and that's the wonderful thing about uh, doing something in your own country in sport that people with the fans 30 odd million as you said and their families still talk about it uh, even today and that that's very uh, it's absolutely brilliant now supporting us over the next three hours we have a whole host of familiar faces and names from the world of football and beyond and to kick us off i'm delighted to say we're joined by glenn hoddle former england midfielder and manager of course who was just about eight years old i think back then in 1966 a small boy but do you have the memories from sitting around with your family watching the television oh absolutely gabby yeah i watched every single game it was so exciting it really was and uh I remember making the big banner, me and my mate Andy Jesse, we walked around the Grove, we used to live in a Grove, we were like the Pied Piper in the end, all these kids come out with us, it was brilliant, I can remember it like it was yesterday, it's brilliant. Which is fantastic because you're going to be watching it back with us in its entirety over the next few hours. Uh, so Jeff, interestingly, this World Cup was played over three weeks and England had to play six games over 20 days. So we are going to be reliving the final, but shall we have a quick look at how England got there? It now gives me great pleasure to declare open the eighth World Football Championships. Wonderful scenes, these. These colour scenes come from a special FIFA film, which is just 20 minutes of colour from the day. But, Sir so Jeff, do you, in your wildest dreams, could you have ever imagined anything like this? Had you experienced anything like the pressure there must have been around this team? Uh, no, nothing at all. I think from my perspective, I didn't start the tournament and I clearly remember sitting on the, on the touchline thinking it was just fantastic to be part of the whole, uh, the whole squad. Um, I wasn't disappointed I wasn't playing. To, for, I never thought I'd be picked for England. So for me to be sitting on the bench in a World Cup final in England, it was just absolutely marvellous. No goals in that first game and I think, I think the crowd were a little bit disappointed, weren't they? Yes, very. Uruguay just came to defend and, and didn't really want to come outside their own half, so it made it uh, quite difficult. Bobby Charlton's goal, of course, re relieved a lot of the pressure from, from the fans and from the team. It was just such a wonderful goal. Typical Bobby Charlton goal from 30 yards. And then it was on to France, and I imagine with the goals scored against Mexico and the victory secured, things must have settled down a little bit, did they? Oh, a great deal, particularly after a difficult start against Uruguay. And that Bobby Charlton goal, of course, was against Mexico, lifted the pressure off the fans and, and the team quite clearly. And then Roger Hunt gets going against the French, didn't he? Yeah, Roger Hunt uh, gets a couple against the French. And Jimmy, of course, uh, badly gashed his shin, meaning he wouldn't take part in the rest of the tournament. And that's big news as well, You're losing Jimmy Greaves, isn't it? And obviously it means opportunity for you. And then we get to this Argentina quarter-final, which really the, the big incident was on 35 minutes when Rattan got a red card. It's, it's an off 
camera incident. So we can't see what he did, but he didn't want to go, did he? He didn't want to leave the pitch. No, absolutely not. He was, he argued for quite some time. Uh, they were a tough side. We'd seen the clip of them prior to playing and we knew it was going to be a really, really uh, almost quite brutal game. And of course, if, if a team plays like that, somebody in that team needs to be sent off. Yeah, and then who gets up and gets the header? <laughs> well, it was a great West Ham goal. As Martin Peters on the left side crossed an absolutely fantastic goal uh, for me to head in. And of course, the incident there with George Cohen trying to swap shirts with Oscar Mass and Alf Ramsey in between, trying to stop them swapping shirts. And Alf made a remark about, you must not swap shirts with these so-and-sos. <laughs> and then Ray Wilson defied him anyway. Um, let's go on then to the semi-final against Portugal, against Eusebio, let's say, you know, who was the Ballon d'Or winner the year before. I mean, had you ever come up against him before? No, I hadn't come across that particular side. It was a very good team. And as much as the, the Argentina game was very tough and brutal, the game against Portugal was a fantastic game of football from both teams. And of course, Bobby Charlton uh, gets a couple. Bobby Charlton's first goal for me was brilliant. Rog Hunt goes in the collision with the keeper. The ball knock comes back to Bobby and he side foots it, if you see, from about 40 yards. The coolness and calmness of Bobby, like now, was fantastic. And of course, um, the sec I must talk about the second one because it's one I uh, had, a, had, a, had a part in. And uh, so I had an assist there, which I guess in a way helped me to keep my place for the, uh, for the final. Scored against Argentina, made, made the second. And I guess that may have been instrumental in Sir Alf keeping with me when the final, when Jimmy possibly was, was fit to play. We see these scenes here of the Portuguese congratulating you and Sir Bobby there, uh, Bobby Moore rising his hand in the air and assembling you all. And you, you, you kind of look like you're in a, some kind of formation at the end. Was this, was this tradition that you did this at the end of the Games? I have absolutely no idea why we did this, uh, any talk about it, why we did it, <laughs> um, probably celebrating the fact we're in the final. So I can't assist you on that whatsoever. <laughs> you look very cool, all of you, anyway. Uh, and obviously, at that moment, the country must have just been full of, you know, the hysteria and the build-up. We'll talk about that in just a moment, because that brings us right up to speed, doesn't it? To the final on the 30th of July, 1966. And we will relive the first half of that in just a moment, along with Glenn and Jeff and a few more very special guests. <laughs> Let's continue our build-up to that 1966 final replay. And so, Jeff, one of the interesting stats about West Germany uh, as we build up to this final is that they've never, ever beaten England before. Yes, it's a lot of people who haven't realised that. But from then, of course, they, they got to the final against us. I think they, in 72, they won the Euros. And, and in 74, they, they won the World Cup. And um, so they vastly improved. And... and what we realise in Germany, football is, is the biggest sport by a long, long way. Whereas in this country, we have cricket and rugby and so on. But you don't realise until they did a few years ago, Germany is their number one sport by a long, long distance. Well, they've certainly been making us pay for it, haven't they, Glenn, ever since? <laughs> <laughs> they certainly have. Uh, yes, we've had that problem, haven't we, against them time and time again. And obviously the big one as well for me as a young kid, I think I was about 13, was in 70 as well. Wow, that was uh, amazing, that game. Watching these pictures here, seeing how smart people were dressing for the final, you know, most of the men walking at Wembley that way there are wearing suits and ties. And the build-up must have been so exciting, Jeff. I imagine, you know, if it was now, a World Cup, you know, in, in a couple of years' time, it'd be wall-to-wall, -wall, wouldn't it, uh, for, for, for days and days. Was it like that then? Well, if it was today, it'd be 100 times bigger. There's no doubt about that. But what is disappointing, you don't get to see the crowds. I'm seeing those crowds now, as I've done over the last few years, and you realise how, how big it is. Uh, but disappointingly, you don't get to see the atmosphere. You're in the dressing room, like we see there. You do not realise until many years later how big it is. Well, that's it for the pre-match build-up. Thank you so much to Glenn and Jeff. We'll be hearing from them and a whole host of special guests throughout the match. But let's get on with the action in front of Her Majesty the Queen. And as a novel twist, we're going to bring you both the BBC and ITV commentary from the final to showcase all the options that were available back in 1966. Later, we'll be hearing from ITV's Hugh Johns. But first, we start with the BBC team. 
of Kenneth Wollstoneholm and co-commentator Wally Barnes, the former Arsenal and Wales captain, who certainly wasn't paid by the word. That is the England team. Number four, of course, is the gentleman that at least some of the fans want to be made Prime Minister, Nobby Stiles. the great hero of West Germany, sailor number nine, captain. Bobby Moore won the Cup Winners' Cup, European Cup Winners' Cup in 65, the FA Cup in 64, will it for the World Cup in 66. Gordon Vance and a great World Cup Vance, and it's Germany to kick off. The rain has stopped. The excitement intense. The ground in many places is soft, but the 1966 World Cup final is underway. The ground is at its softest. The Goma to our left has sink good two or three inches. There. England going to be taken by Wilson. by Peters. Schnellinger. Competition is not to become uh, the most defensive minded. Seven goals have got to be produced in this final. That would give the same average of goals per game as 1962. I'm delighted to say we're now joined by Bobby Moore's widow, Stephanie Moore. Great to have you with us, Stephanie. Was Bobby one of those kinds of people who liked to sit down and watch highlights of his career? He never ever used to do that. Um, what he would do was um, speak about it to people when they asked, but often it, it was in a very dismissive way, as though everybody could go out and play football just like he did. What was his favorite memory of the day? I can't actually speak for Bobby, but what he did say was that it was all over very, very quickly, a bit like a, a person's wedding, I suppose, where there's so much going on, it's difficult to savor every moment. But what he did often chuckle about was how he was really concerned about his hands being dirty, going up to shake a majesty's hands. Um, that did concern him quite a bit. Some of our younger viewers won't remember Bobby. Just describe him for us as a person. Mm. <laughs> um, he was tall, athletic, very, very kind, um, very modest, always had time for people, um, and very inclusive, very forgiving. He was one of life's true gentlemen. He had a great, dry, mischievous sense of humour. You've raised millions for charity since Bobby passed away, so you understand just how powerful it can be when communities come together in the name of football. The footballing community has allowed the Bobby Moore Fund for Cancer Research UK to raise nearly 28 million pounds for vital bowel cancer research and also to raise awareness. The footballing community, the fans, are second to none. And we know everybody's missed their football during this time. We can't wait for it to start again. And I just hope that 
as many clubs as possible survive this time. Thanks so much for joining us, Stephanie. It's so lovely of you to share those memories and hopefully you can enjoy the moment when Bobby walks up the steps and takes the Jules Rimet from the Queen. Thank you. Nice to speak to you. He's held in the two for five men covering banks. Back to Emmerich. That was the wrong foot for Mr. Emmerich. Top goal scorer in Germany last season. Emmerich comes from Borussia Dortmund. And they've got already enjoying this. Again, Styles taking a good position. See the role of Schultz. Swoops up and in and gets to that back line. Styles moves forward. Styles number four. Jack Charles up to Zeller. Four German forwards up. Corner. That's Ube Zeller. Was thought at one time he would miss this competition because of bad leg injury, but he's all right now. Haller with the corner for West Germany. And the Hunt and Hurst moving up. And so too Styles again. Charlton, Bobby Charlton, Hurst, Cohen, and the goalkeeper flat out injured. And Ball gave away a free kick pushing with Tilkowski. Tilkowski, the goalkeeper, got a bang then. I think Kenny might have got a, a bang in the face there because Jeff Hurst went in to get that in. And they were both concentrating on the ball. It was a pure accident. There's no more than that. Well, Jeff, it was a nasty collision, wasn't it? An innocent collision. But Tilkovsky looks clearly like he was, for a few moments at least, uh, unconscious there. And, and perhaps in today's game, you know, he'd have been off the pitch, wouldn't he? Not playing on. But these were the days where there were no substitutes. So they had to keep him on. That's right. I don't think it was quite as, as bad as it appears. You can see there that I was well above him. And in fact, he punched me in the eye. On the evening, I finished up with a black eye. So it was a perfectly fair challenge. What I do say now on reflection, it did soften him up for my, my first goal when he didn't want to come for any more crosses. So that was quite a good thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, he was, he was kind of one of the players that was quite vulnerable, uh, people thought, going into this, Glenn. And that certainly didn't help, did it? Well, he, he, he didn't look, Jeff, did he, as if he had much presence. He, his size was relatively small, even back in the day in 66. He doesn't look to me as if, you know, broad shoulders, he wants to come and get everything. And I think it was evident what you've just said there. The second, you know, the first goal, when you and Bobby uh, get eye contact, he did, he's nowhere in the, in the shot, is he, uh, when it comes up. So I think you, you absolutely did the right thing. You got away with it and uh, roughed him up a little bit. And it's mentioned in commentary, uh, it can't have been a very warm summer. It must have been a lot of rain that summer because the pitch is getting cut up quite badly, isn't it? It doesn't look in the best of nick, Jeff. Yes, it rained quite heavily before the game, strangely enough, quite heavily. And uh, during the game, of course, it, uh, the rain stopped, abated, and uh, it was a very warm afternoon. But it did cut up, particularly uh, later on in the game, just outside their penalty area and the in, in extra time which uh, will make a marked difference in how the, f the final goal went in. And like so many big finals, Glenn, and so many matches with, you know, so much at stake, there's quite a nervy build-up from what we've seen so far in this, the opening exchange. Yeah, I think so. 
I think so, Gabby. The first five minutes, I was just relating how many mistakes were made. Both teams were giving the ball away, but I think there was a little bit of tension there. And Wembley's a big, big pitch as well, and very sapping if it was a little bit damp as well. But I think it settles down eventually. But I was surprised with the amount of mistakes. I think there's just the tension. Ten minutes gone, no score. The Germans have been called the greatest actors since Martin Harvey, but... Um... Obviously, Mr. Dietz isn't going to have any nonsense from him. We kick to West Germany. Mr. Dietz, without doubt, one of the greatest referees on the people list. Beckenbauer is going to take this one. Solid enough, all 11 of them coming back. Now it's ball with Bobby Charlton breaking on the left. Hurst inside and Hunt right down the middle. And now Peters coming up. This is Peters. No, well, the fans seem satisfied the way things are going at the moment. But it's both teams still doing a lot of sparring. And Wilson penalised. Taking Zayla's ankles. Halla to Zayla. Schnellinger now to Helt, number 10. Who is the battle? Now to Halla, a goal! West Germany has scored. 12 minutes gone. Helmut Halla has put West Germany in the lead. So Halle scores Germany 1-0 up after 12 minutes. I'm delighted to say we can bring in now George Cohen, uh, of course, one of Sir Jeff's teammates that day. And George, sorry to bring you in as England go behind, but we just talked a moment ago about the pitch cutting up a little bit and a nervy start. What were feelings like at this moment? Well, you can imagine it was a bit of a shock going down so quickly, 1-0. Um, it, it was a case of uh, just a mistake by one of the best full-backs I've ever seen, Ray it, it's, uh, it just He's just beneath the ball and he just dropped to Haller, the worst person in the world you want to drop a uh, ball to in, a, in the 18-yard line, and on the 18-yard line. But there we are, it was 1-0 down, but we, we got over it very quickly. You did indeed. Let's talk a little bit about this squad and the potential. You've been involved since 64. Did you see when you came in that this was a, a squad with the potential to win a World Cup? We so often hear the phrase, don't we, golden generation in modern times. Did it feel like you had that magic amongst you? Well, I think you could, you could feel that uh, as time went on. I, I was in 64, as you know, but uh, Alf was still building the team. And, uh, you know, you, you felt that he was putting, putting together a, a group of young players that, apart from Jack, of course, who, <laughs> don't tell him that, whatever you do, <laughs> yeah, um, that uh, you know, could, could do rather well. And we had done very well up, right up to the World Cup, you know, about, about six or seven games, we hadn't lost anything at all. And we were looking at quite a, you know, quite a good outfit. Jeff. Alf Ramsey has described George as the best right back that England have ever had. He was vice captain as well, a leader within this squad. How much did you look up to him? Well, I was just a kid and, and people like George were senior players who'd been around a, a year or two earlier. And the great thing about George on a personal basis, everybody I talk to who's met George before comes to me and says, what a lovely man he is. Um, but as a player, he was tough. I loved his warm-up before the game. He did about 15 knees-ups. In the days when you didn't warm up on the pitch, you warmed up in the dressing room. And he had this habit of just doing 50 or 60 knees-ups uh, consecutively as his warm-up. And physically, um, one of the strongest members of the team. We saw you getting into a little bit of trouble in the quarter-final. Well, after the quarter-final against Argentina, when you were trying to swap shirts, George, you didn't get away with it. Ray Wilson did a few moments later, though. Yes, that was a bit much, wasn't it? I was, I was, hoping, to get a, I was hoping to get a shirt. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Elf, was, Elf was a bit uh, annoyed at, at the way the, uh, the Argentine were playing. 
and uh, he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't let us swap the shirts. And in fact, he, he called them animals, which got him got him into trouble with the FA and, and FIFA. And uh, really, uh, it was it was unfortunate. But he was really very upset with the way that the the Argentine were playing. So um, unfortunately, it was one of those things. I'm sure. I'm sure uh, you got over it. Um, and when there were bigger prizes, weren't there, to get uh, a few days later? Have you ever watched this final back in its entirety? Yes, a couple of times. But you, you, you know, you do see um, uh, parts of this of the final over the years. Um, nothing's changed, by the way. So you know, it's. Um, I still enjoy watching it. Well, good. Back to the action. I feel there could be an equaliser coming. Throw to England. defence, a strong physical team. Haller coming across to take it, Haller plays for Bologna, now got five goals in the competition. He needs another four to equal Eusebio. Over out. Ball coming away. Ripped by Overart. And England take the quick free kick. And up comes Wilson. Charlton. And there's number 21, Hunt, with Weber close to him all the time. And there's Tukovsky, the German goalkeeper. And all the German supporters making all the noise at the moment. Bobby Charlton. up for the attack and brought down by Oberat with a big kick in goes it's an equaliser you can that was a, a brilliant piece of football there by Bobby Moore he looked up and he saw that the Germans had momentarily gone flat across the penalty area and he flighted it, of course, to his own home club player who must always be looking for this type of cross when Bobby Moore's in position. And there he is, to put England back on level terms now. So it didn't take long for England to get back in the game. And Jeff, you got them going uh, there. And must be wonderful playing with the, the players of calibre of, of Bobby Moore and Bobby Charlton when you're a forward player. Well, it's a typical West Ham goal. Uh, you, we worked at that uh, at the club. We were told with Ron Greenwood, just if something is on, just do it. So it's complete understanding from, from kids who grew up together and taking the free kick uh, as quick as that. And my stupid um, celebration afterwards, which you noticed there, was a sense of I'm back now. I'm, I'm back to my best. I didn't start the tournament. I'm back doing what I can do best. And that was a really, I always looked upon a really stupid celebration but one of, one of total elation and getting back into the game um, much very quickly as well. That's also important. Absolutely. And when you say getting back to your best, I think getting back to your best when it's a World Cup final is what you call timing, isn't it, Glenn Hoddle? 
it certainly is. There's no better way, is there, than a, a World Cup final from quarterfinals in. What Jeff did was incredible. We forget that, that he scored an important goal against Argentina, which was a tough game. Everyone talks about the hat-trick, but it was a great response. Going 1-0 down at Wembley at home, you know, all that expectation. You needed to get back uh, before half-time, back in the game, and uh, Bobby Moore was brilliant there. It was the first time, really, as a centre-back, he's coming to the opponent's half. And he actually gains the foul, and that's why he's so quick to put his hand on the ball, Jeff. And it's a little bit of eye contact, like you're saying. And uh, it was a wonderful finish. And uh, as we spoke about earlier, the goalkeeper was nowhere to be seen. I think you'd, uh, you'd roughed him up a little bit. He didn't fancy coming out a second time. So it was a wonderful response. Oh, absolutely. It's, it is important you get back in the game quickly. You don't want to go stay behind for too long against a good German team. Uh, it, it was a great equaliser for the team, but I think we were a, we were a hard-nosed professional team, and we never got disillusioned or disappointed when we went down when things went against us against us, as we see uh, later in the game, uh, which a hard-nosed bunch of professional players. Let's get back to the action now, and it's time to hear from ITV's Hugh Johns. I don't know whether, in fact, he took Peter's name then, or whether he just warned him that if he did it again, he'd take his name. Schnellinger with the free kick for Germany. Sailors in behind that. Weber not timing that ball well. Cohen. Bobby Charlton. Charlton and Beckenbauer with him. Now Charlton. Looking for the return ball. Wasn't quite on. George Cohen. Poor old George. George Cohen playing in his 30th international. He still hasn't scored a goal for England. And poor old George, if he kicks him like that, he won't either. Incredible how high off the ground this little man sailor gets. And uh, Haller is offside a mile. inside the box and he's off the ground and bulleting his head its heads toward the goal we're joined now by another member of the successful 1966 squad former Southampton winger Terry Payne Terry everyone talks about how this squad had great team spirit was that evident at the time yes it was it was um, it was like we would say a, a sort of a club team and um, the way that Alf Ramsey went about sort of uh, treating everybody exactly the same gave it that kind of feeling and even when it came to the bonuses all the players agreed that whatever the bonuses were that we would actually uh, share it whether we played or not so that just shows you the, the kind of camaraderie that we have uh, amongst the group and um, quite honestly I've never been with a happier group and you were one of four players, along with Jimmy Greaves, John Connelly and Ian Callaghan, who played in the tournament but not in the final. So how disappointing was it to miss out? Well, obviously, everybody wants to play at a World Cup final. Um, I played against Mexico the second game and um, I've got a reputation of never been injured. And I played all those games for Southampton, as you probably know. And can, lo and behold, against Mexico, I got a bang on the head. The uh, left back headed me in the back of the head 
and I can't remember the game. To this day, I can't remember. I played all the game, no substitutes, and uh, I woke up on the on, in the dressing room table, on the table, on the treatment table. So although I played in the World Cup, I can't remember a thing about it. And watching the game unfold there in your suit, were you confident as the game progressed? Well, we had to be confident. Alf Ramsey said two or three years before, we will win the World Cup. So, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of sort of pressure on him as well. Um, but, you know, we, we, we were a good side. There was no doubt about that. The funny thing about it was, as you know, no substitute. So I was sat with George Eastman in the stands and we were told two or three minutes before the end to come down to the bench so that we could celebrate. We were winning 2-1 at the time, but regardless, to come down after 90 minutes or just before the 90 minutes, well, while we were running down to get down to the bench, of course, Germany scored. We never, George and I never even saw, saw the goal. So they equalised 2-2. And then there are photographs of about five or six of us actually sat on the, on the red carpet because there was nowhere, nowhere on the bench to sit. So we all sat on, sat on the red carpet and watched the extra time from there. So overall, would you say you have happy memories of July 1966? Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I mean, obviously, remember, I was still a second division player there. I hadn't even played in the first division as it was in those days. I mean, give you the kind of thing we had then, Mark, in, in 1966. The Friday before the game on the Saturday, we all walked down to Hendon Centre and went to a film, watch a film with Alf. Nobody bothered us. We strolled down, we strolled back. Nobody bothered us at all. Just imagine the, the World Cup team trying to do that now. Thank you so much for joining us, Terry. And of course, on the day, only the first 11 got medals. So it was brilliant in 2009 when we saw you and the other 10 squad players receive your medals retrospectively. Very richly deserved. Now Alan Ball with the corner. Emmerich. Man with a tremendous left foot. Beckenbauer. Franz Beckenbauer. Peters for England. Ray Wilson. Jeff Hurst. Bobby Charlton. Styles, and it's all across the park at the moment. Now Cohen. Moore. England trying to find a hole. Moore. Bobby Moore, almost a little bit of uh, anger about that one. It had all been going across the park. He felt something should be driven forward, so he put the shot in himself. This is Weber, Zela. 15 minutes of the second half of the first half left and score 1-1. One, one. Haller. Overath. Schneider. A little Allen ball chasing back there. This referee is saying he won't have any of this. Well, I'm delighted to say we can bring in the legendary commentator, Barry Davis, who's uh, watching on with interest. Barry, you, of course, were working for ITV during the tournament. Did you ever think there was a chance you might get the final for ITV? Uh, in theory, there was a one in four chance. Um, because John Romney, the boss, said we had to ring in after the quarterfinals. I rang in and said, if you change your jobs, you're, you're off your head. So I was never a real contender for the best man had the job for ITV. So where were you on the day of the final? Where did you watch it? Standing absolutely behind him in the commentary box. So that was the closest I came. Um, 
And in fact, when I look back on it, if the World Cup had been somewhere else other than in England that year, you wouldn't be talking to me about this thing now. I wouldn't have had anything to do with it because it, it, it set me up. And I've always been uh, grateful to Mr. Hurst and the rest of it. Sir Hurst, I beg your pardon, Jeff, um, and the rest of the team. It was a great day. And this is a match which for me got more and more interesting. There were ups and downs, but uh, eventually it goes to an extra time. I think we can tell people that. So this is a, this is a long watch, but a good watch. <laughs> and extra time for me is when England really were world champions. You see, you can tell you're a television pro because you're teasing it so people don't leave us. The game builds and builds and it's extra time where they really want to be with us. Things really get tasty. For, for you, though, Barry, a few years later, you move to the BBC, become a legend of match of the day. And Kenneth Wilsonholm, of course, is, you know, that iconic line and commentators, you know, are kind of remembered for those big lines. You have so many yourself, don't you? You know, where were the Germans? Um, but what did you learn from Kenneth Wollstone-Holmes' commentary and, and the way he went about things? Well, to realize that the best line from a commentator had it was said in 1966, and any up and coming commentator knows that. <laughs> um, in fact, it was the simplicity of it. When you look at it, he saw some people on the pitch, and in those days people didn't invade pitches at the wrong time. So he assumed that they thought the match had come to an end. So he said, some people are on the pitch. Then he's thinking to himself, why would they be on the pitch? They must think it's all over. So he said, they, must, they think it's all over. And then the real line, when Jeff thumped the ball from a brilliant pass by Bobby Moore, thumped the ball into the roof of the net, he simply said, it is now. Three simple words, but it said everything. Uh, spoiler alert, if you don't know the result, Barry may have given away something about the ending of this drama that's about to unfold. Um, but that was oh, that line, as you say, when you dissect it like that, actually, Barry, <laughs> <laughs> it's so, I, you know, the, the interesting thing is, Barry, though, we're talking to the players. They've only seen it a couple of times in its entirety. I, I have never seen it before today in its entirety. Um, and, you know, we've all seen key moments over the years, but as time goes on, and it's such a long time now uh, since this match, seeing even the replays in colour, uh, you know, and you realise, well, first of all, you realise it's, it's such a long time since England have won something, which we're reminded every couple of years. Um, but that simplicity that you mentioned there, of that, of that line, you know, so many of the greatest commentators and broadcasters, you know, when you distill it, it is about simplicity, isn't it? Sure. It is. Uh, you know, my attitude has always been that I open my mouth and hope my foot is sufficiently far away. So it comes or it doesn't. Say the right thing or you don't. He said the right thing at the right time for the right team and something that's never been repeated. But we still hope in a future World Cup, there are a lot of good young players around that might, might uh, bring the, uh, the weight to an end. And any young commentators listening to you now might just think to themselves that if they are fortunate enough to be in that seat, actually, it might not be the lines that they've planned beforehand. It could be a, a moment that they are able to vocalise. When it comes to you know, kind of digging back into the memories, obviously, you say it was the greatest day. What, what did you do afterwards? How did you celebrate? What was London like that evening? London was alive. Um, the atmosphere was totally different from the atmosphere that came to the game just a short time afterwards, and we don't want to dwell on that. But I was at the hotel where the celebration was. Um, that wouldn't have been allowed now, because as I understand it, the team and the men at uh, dinner in one room and their wives and sweethearts were in another room. Well, I don't think that would be uh, the case should uh, the World Cup be won by England again. <laughs> and quite rightly, it, sh it should never have been. Thank you so much for, for joining in and, uh, and lending us your wonderful tones this afternoon as well. You're too kind. Thank you. Let's get back to the action with Barry's former colleague, Hugh Johns. Chance for over -run.
so much trouble there. Tremendous save by Banks from Overath and then grabbing this return shot from, from Emmerich. And the England defence, which has looked so, so strong, so powerful all through this competition, now this afternoon, showing little signs of weariness, little moments of indecision. Hunt, Hunt using his elbows to hold off uh, Weber and a free kick. Haller, Putches, Beckenbauer, Putches, Beckenbauer. Schnellinger has Overath deep on the left. Held. Schnellinger inside him. Sailor in front of him. Long one for Haller. Wilson reading that one very quickly. Wilson made a lot of, uh, lot of ground to cut that ball out away from Haller. defence certainly being extended a little by the German forwards Banks chipping it away and a foul surely against Schnellinger then no Schultz forward Beckenbauer Weber Schultz Weber Overath. Overath moving for the return ball, but it's Schnellinger. That was a long, useless ball. Styles to Allen Ball. Schnellinger, as usual, the fair haired boy close to him, but Styles cuts it, cuts it in. Ball. Now Bobby Charlton. George Cohen. Very nearly found Hurst with that one. Peters. But now Zeller for Germany. And the German hunting horns are baying out as Zeller moves forward, but it's held. Charlton didn't even blink as he cut that one out. Bobby Moore. Hurst is in the middle. Ball is in the middle. Hunt, who didn't really seem to be expecting that one. And difficulty picking it up. Easily robbed by Weber. And Schultz. Brings Tilkowski into the game. Zeller now, and it seems apparent that he's he's coming away from the middle, trying to find some room to work in. He hasn't got anywhere against Jack Chop down the middle, and now he's out on the right wing, hoping to find a little more freedom out there. And now more for England. Peters to more. Hunt. Directed ball. Emmerich and Moore having to cut across. And Bobby Moore was England's hero right then because Emmerich had a free run towards goal due to that badly directed pass from Roger Hunt. Now Alan Bell has George Cohen outside. Cohen. Ball. Bobby Charlton. Wilson. Hurst is under there. Hunt now with a great chance. Oh, a 
Roger Hunt really should have made it 2 1 then. That was a wonderful chance. And I don't think Tilkowski made the save there. I think the ball actually hit him. He didn't know what had happened. Moore. Aiming it back for Hurst. Now Peters. Bobby Charlton. He's going to take on Beckenbauer first. Good ball here for Peters. Allen ball now. Oh. Ove Zela for Germany. Zela. And that was almost there. Well, Gordon Banks only just got his fingertips to that one. Ove Zela. Let's bring in Sir Jeff Hurst and Glenn Hoddle for your thoughts as we're heading close to half time now. We just saw there a great challenge from Bobby Moore and then he's running up the left wing. And, you know, we haven't really talked much so far, Jeff. We've talked a bit about the West Ham connection, but not about what he contributed as a person to this squad. Well, I, pl I played more games with Bobby than anybody else. So I saw him grow up and, and realised what a great player he was, how he took responsibility. And it is quite noticeable in this game. He makes two of the goals. And he's, he's, he's looked upon as a sweet, great sweep, but he spent so much time in the opponent's half setting up things. And he was just a, a, he was the best player I played with. He was absolutely fantastic, a great leader um, and, and a great captain. And what was he like in the dressing room? You know, you, you're about to go in one all at half time in a World Cup final, having gone behind, you know, got yourselves back level. What, what kind of things would he say? Was he somebody who was quite rousing? Not at all, completely the opposite. Very, very calm, no big speeches, no shouting at people. In fact, Alan Ball used to say, if, if, if Bobby raised his eyebrow at you, you knew you were in trouble. So he had that sort of command over, over the people without shouting and screaming. Uh, and he was that, that, he was that kind of leader, just set by example in everything he did. Just saw a great save there, Glenn, by Gordon Banks. You know, if you're going to win a World Cup, you need your keeper to be on top form, don't you? It was a top save, wasn't it? And earlier on as well, he, um, there was a, a real good chance for, for West Germany and he made a double save. And um, when you've got that security behind you, it must be a great feeling for Sir Alf Ramsey to have the number one goalkeeper in the world there. And I think he, uh, over the next four years afterwards, up to the 70 World Cup, you know, he was the best in the world. There's no doubt about it. But uh, going back to Bobby Moore, just watching this 45 minutes, to me, he, looked like a, he looks like a player that could, is played in any era. He's playing one-touch football. He's in the right position every time. As Jeff says, he, he just shifts into the midfield and goes on. He's, he's been absolutely imperious. He's fantastic. The, the play, you could see him playing in the modern game now, playing with any team. Um, he, he's that good. His using use of the ball is just, oh, just wonderful. And uh, what a player! What a player! Okay, thank you for the moments, chaps. Bobby Charlton skating away from Beckenbauer. Hurst is under this. So is Schultz. Peter's getting himself in trouble. But Charlton now back to Wilson. Now more. Hurst. Styles in his eagerness to get things going. But in Bobby Moore's way. Now it's Alan Ball. Referee Godfrey Dunst is looking at his watch. He's in injury time. The injury he added on for the knock that Tilkowski took early in the game. And there is the whistle for half time. And the teams troop off the field with the scores level at 1 1. England won, West Germany won, with a small matter of the Jules Rimet on the line. England playing in red shirts, remember, this afternoon because of the colour clash. They're in the dark shirts. 
And England kick off attacking the goal on your left at the start of the second half. First under this and Schultz slips on the greasy pitch and Alan Ball. Charlton moving forward into shooting position. Schultz, Bobby, Bobby more or less fell over his own feet that time. as Nobby Styles open across the right that's where it's got to go Schultz a big big shout for handball there Styles finding hers the return ball to Styles and Emmerich brings down Styles and gets the ball to play at the same time no foul another throw in Styles making good space down there. Now Jack Charlton. Ball. Ball still has it. Sheer determination is taking the ball down there at the moment. And he's finally brought down from behind by Hodges. And that's a free kick to England. Fiery little redhead from Blackpool, Alan Ball, and it's George Cohen with the free kick. More to Hunt. Trying a long one, Jack Charlton under this. Ooh. Sailor to Haller. And Held is making good space forward. This is Held. And a free kick. His referee has called a free kick back. Held was offside as he moved through. He could only be in a fraction of an inch in it. Well, I'm delighted to say that former FA chairman Greg Dyke can join us now. Uh, a few generations after this match, of course, Greg. Um, but you were 19 during this World Cup. You went to the semi-final, I believe. I went to quite a few of the games. Um, I mean, it was bizarre, really. You just, it wasn't difficult to get tickets. I remember I, you couldn't get a ticket for the final, but I, the semi-final, I think I went down to Wembley and bought four or six tickets for my family. <laughs> and you that wasn't, believe. you didn't buy them off a, a tout or anything, you just rock up and... Just walked up to the, uh, to the FA's uh, ticket office and they sold you the tickets. And I was, a, I was just a fan. Incredible. Yeah, it... And then the final itself, where did you watch that? Well, I, I, I didn't have a ticket, any, I couldn't get a ticket anyway, but I was on holiday in Wales. Uh, so I watched it with a bunch of about 20 of us in my aunt's little house, uh, watching it on the smallest black and white television you can imagine. Um, and, but I have to say, all the Welsh were all on our side, which I'm not sure would have been the case if you'd gone to Scotland. Oh. <laughs> I think you're probably cor quite correct there. Um, tell me a little bit, though, about where this ranks in your, you know, this period ranks in your football memories. Because you're a teenager, it's a good age, isn't it? You know, that you can, you can really remember quite clearly what you felt like and how it changed people and, you know, what it did for the nation. 
But, well, I mean, it did, ma- it did a massive thing for the nation, but oddly, I think we see it as more important now than we did then, because I don't think any of us ever thought we'd go another 50 years without winning. I mean, I just thought, I mean, we should have, I mean, to be fair, we should have won the next tournament as well. Um, but uh, it, was, it was an exciting time, but as I say, I think we thought this wouldn't be England's only victory. Yeah, and, and perhaps that, as time goes on, you mentioned the chance in 70, and as time goes on and World Cups get ticked off the calendar, it weighs heavier and heavier, doesn't it? And your time as chairman of the FA, did you feel that, that it, it wasn't so much a legacy as a burden almost to live up to this period and to live up to these men? Well, I was chairman of the FA for the 50th anniversary. Um, so it all came back. And, uh, I mean, I watched it. I've watched it, I think, three times. I watched it originally. I watched it uh, 20 years later. I bought the rights to the colour film for ITV. We made a documentary called uh, The Boys of 66. We were doing quite a lot of things for the 50th. I thought I ought to see it again. There were enormous periods of watching it where nobody says anything at all. There's no commentary at all. You know, it's Ball, Peters, Charlton, and it was just a different form of, of coverage in those days. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we mentioned at the very beginning, Wally Barnes, the co-commentator, hardly speaks at all. When you think now, big set-piece matches in World Cups will have potentially two uh, co-commentators working with the main voice, and and there is often a, a conversation, isn't there, pretty much throughout, and a, a dialogue, and, and let alone the technology, the replays, the fact that, you know, the clock comes in as an actual clock on the screen. We, I mean, we, we, we kind of are quite nostalgic about things from the past, but I would say football coverage is infinitely better as a viewer, isn't it, in 2020? I think it's much better. Um, the other things that have changed, I mean, you look at this Wembley pitch, it's not a great pitch in those days, was it? Um, I mean, I also don't. It's very funny. I mean, watching this film with you now, it's it's torrential rain. I don't remember that at all. I just I thought it was all sunshine. But that's that's maybe what happens when you uh, when you win, or, or not. It's, we won't know. And also when you're on holiday, when you're on holiday in Wales, Greg, as well, and the sun's shining wherever you were in Wales. Uh, yeah, you're probably remembering the weather where you were maybe that day. <laughs> Yeah, the pitch, the pitch definitely is getting worse and worse, isn't it? But the match, according to everybody who's seen it, gets better and better. So thank you so much, Greg, for sharing your memories from that day. Pitch is not making things easier for the players out there. Overath, Beckerbar, Schnellinger. Held to Schnellinger. Good return ball for Held. This is Emmerich. Ball. And finally, Charlton brings it away with Martin Peters making a good break down the left. Three England players advancing on four. German defenders. Enthusiasm of Martin Peters can't be faulted, but uh, you really must try and straighten those shots out. Overath. Schnellinger. Schalken cuts it out. But Schnellinger to Overath. Beckenbauer. Sailor. Yeah. 
held for Germany. Zeller inside him. This could be dangerous. But the imperturbable Jack Charlton is across there to cut off the danger again. For my money, the outstanding man of this England defence in the World Cup series. Beckenbauer. And it's a jolly good job. Franz Beckenbauer didn't get his full power behind that one. The scorer of four World Cup goals for Germany so far. It was a rather loose one by Willy Schultz. Over there in the right-hand corner, you can see Alf Ramsey and the England team chiefs anxiously watching this game. Good ball. But Germany get it away through Haller. Touches. Two England men right on top of each other. This is not good enough. Over off. And uh, Schnellinger. This is held for Germany. Beckenbauer. So, Jeff, we talked a little bit about Bobby Moore and his presence in the dressing room, and he's a quiet leader, maybe he did more on the pitch than in terms of rousing speeches. What would Sir Alf Ramsey have been like at half-time in this final? What was he saying to do differently in the second half? Very little uh, team speeches, much of his management style right throughout the time I was involved, very much on a one-to-one on -one basis which for me is good management. You let a player know exactly what you expect of him. And of course, if he doesn't come up to that, you can nail him. And he did a remarkable job, we must remember, at Ipswich, winning the first division championship there. And now when he's in charge of a group of players with four or five world-class players, plus the hard-nosed professionals, he picks people. One of his great sayings was, when he picked a new player, he will not let me down. And I think that sums up the type of players he had under his... Um, control. Interesting that, Glenn, isn't it? Because there's, you know, so many schools of thought about management. You know, do you pick a system and get the players to work in the system? Do you pick individuals that you know have got something about them, even though they might not be the most technically proficient? And clearly that the person was as important to him, that the kind of man who you could go into battle with. Yeah, of course. I mean, you need, that's the beauty of football. You need, you know, it's a team game and the manager needs to have a balance. That balance needs to be there 100%, whether you're planning to win a World Cup or you're playing on a Sunday morning uh, football. You have to have that balance. And that's why you people like Nobby Styles, you know, you've got Bobby Charlton and Nobby Styles in the centre of that midfield. It's a really good balance. Uh, it really is. And uh, then you've got the world-class players, as we see now on the ball, Bobby Moore, who has been absolutely outstanding in this game. He hasn't given the ball away. But I think, uh, I think this is a stage where, quite incredibly, for me, as a manager, the game's sort of very stretched, and you're looking, and, and in the modern day, you'd be looking now, at this moment, what substitutes am I going to put on? And they didn't, you know, Sir Alf didn't have that uh, luxury. And no. the players knew that they had to play right to the very end. So it's an incredible uh, scene to see this game being played as it is now, knowing that it's going to go on and on. <laughs> and the fitness levels yeah. at the end of a tournament, it's quite incredible. It really is. It's, uh, it's staggering to see. Well, yeah. 
with so many twists and turns still to come, as you say, and the game's so stretched. And in fact, one of the surprising things when looking at this footage, Jeff, and I, and I don't say this, you know, in any way, you know, being condescending or at all, you know, patronising, we're, we're led to believe that footballers of this era, there was a different level of sports science and, and perhaps, you know, there was slightly more relaxed attitude towards alcohol and, and food and things. It's really clear from this, especially when, you know, the shirt take, uh, has been taken off. These are fit, fit athletes. You, you were all proper athletes here who look like there's a lot of conditioning and a lot of training going on off the ball. Absolutely. I think Nobby style summed it up um, after the World Cup when he talks about the preparation we had at Lillishaw, where the 27 players were, had to be reduced to 22 for the finals. And he talks quite often about the, the aggressive and how... Uh, terrific and hard that was in the, those uh, five-a-side games and 11-a-side games. It was very aggressive, no uh, quarter taken at all. And I think that just to typically reflects how, uh, how strong and, and aggressive that team was because the practices were, as Nobby said, very, very, uh, very rough. And of course, you, as, as you know now, we know now that training and all those extra hours not only to go through a whole tournament to go through extra time as well not giving too much away was very much needed over us Weber leaving it for Schnellinger now held Weber and the Germans attacking with five men is held now Schnellinger Bobby Charlton a long one down the right would be a good ball at the moment no he lets it go to Alan Ball on the left at that moment Hurst was linking was lying unmarked down the right wing this is Hunt and Weber gets a big hand from the German crowd he refused to buy the dummy that Hunt tried to sell him. Ball over the line, over the line. <laughs> Alan Ball showing his annoyance, which is echoed by the England fans at that end of the ground. Germans up in attack now. This is Schnellinger to Held. Held, teeing himself up for one. And George Cohen got in the way of it. Held still there. And he finally took Bobby Moore to join in to build that ball away. England looking just a little bit uh, suspect as the Germans poured the pressure on there. Held with the corner. Beckenbauer. Now Bobby Chalk for England. And again, Beckenbauer tight to him again. Beckenbauer giving Bobby Chalk very little room to work in. Short sweeping up the danger as usual. And Hunt winning this one. Oh, 
foul against Wolfgang Oberath as he shoved Hunt off this ball. And again, yes, Jack Charlton that time. And that was almost a carbon copy of the free kick that Bobby Moore took in the first half. Quickly taken, and this time it was Jack Charlton who buzzed in there quickly. But his header was just past the post. to receive that pass from Beckenbauer. Cohen losing it. And determinedly gets another try. Ball. Peters for England. As Hurst outside him. And England trying to whack the ball through a, a wall of human flesh too often. Haller. Styles now. Wilson. Hunt is under this and got a nudge from Schultz. And now held for Germany. Charlton, Jack Charlton. Running himself into a lot of trouble. Haller for Germany. Charlton. And a foul against Bobby Stiles when Haller fell a good yard away from the tackle. The referee saying quieten down. Well, while there's just a, a slight break in play, let's bring in a woman who has played over 100 times for England, Alex Scott. Great to see you, Alex. And of course, the star on the shirt that you wore so many times for England, a legacy of this World Cup, was that something that you were conscious of and thought about when you pulled the shirt on? Every time, I have to admit, you knew that that star, because obviously England, they were champions, world champions, and what that meant to everyone. And I remember every time I put that England shirt on, just the pride and the honour, every single cap mattered to me. Have you watched this World Cup final back in its entirety before? Or like so many of us, have you only seen snippets along the way? Just snippets. Obviously, you always see the celebration and then the, some of the highlights. But actually sitting down and watching the whole game, I've never done that before. And of course, you've pulled the shirt on and played against Germany. What is it, do you think, that rivalry and that relationship that always make those encounters so special? Those games were one of the best in my England career. Just the build-up, the talk around it, that rivalry, and especially in the women's game, the Germans, they were always superior to us. And it took us years and years to close that gap. And when we finally did, that moment of beating them, it was, it was that build-up of just years of frustration of never being at their level. So I remember in the World Cup uh, 2015, to get that bronze medal and beat Germany, for us, was everything. And it's incredible, we've talked about in the build-up to this, that actually before this World Cup, well, obviously including this World Cup, West Germany had never beaten England. And then, you know, how things changed for so many years. And then, of course, they were the team that undid England so many times in major tournaments at crucial stages as well. But the expectation, Alex, you know, Jeff Hurst said it was, you know, relatively kind of subdued almost compared to what he said it would be like today. There was an excitement, but perhaps it was because people thought, well, we'll go on and win another one. And it's been so long now that England have won a major tournament. It grows and grows, doesn't it? What's it like for you when you're in a major tournament, not even on home soil, having that expectation of a nation? 
I think you do. You feel the pressure and you know that when you look around the changing rooms, some players, they like those big games. They thrive on that pressure. And you are looking around being like, OK, I can see that that player over there is a bit nervous. I'm going to have to get around her to build her up in the big moment. Because, you know, with any England team, there's an expectancy on you. Everyone at home expects that you are going to go to a championship, a World Cup, a Euros, and you are actually going to medal and that you should medal. Um, but for me, that was always a good pressure. And of course, it all comes again, doesn't it? That pressure in the next two years, the, the, the men's Euros have been moved to next year and that has finals and knockout games being played at Wembley. And then the women's is a home tournament in two years time. So that excitement, anticipation and pressure is, is all coming, but it's also a chance for great glory. And we could be sitting here, you know, in over 60 years still talking about it. Oh, don't we all hope? We hope that we see any England team go on to lift the World Cup or the Euros and just see them on the podium. But I think what we're seeing with both the men's and the women's team is a young, fresh group of players playing as a team. And it's gotten every single fan, even me, excited every time they put on that England shirt now. We are. We're expecting them to produce magic. And I don't know, there's something special with both teams happening at the moment. I feel like they're peaking at just the right time. Let's hope so. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, enjoy the rest of the match. Bobby Charlton just had a good chance there. I feel something's coming, so let's get back on with the action. Vance Beckenbauer trying this one. Vance Beckenbauer plays centre-half for his club, Bayern Munich. Just 15 minutes of the second half left. And again, England move forward. Into Hurst. Chucks for ball, chasing this one. And ball, pushed down. Ball pushed down by Weber. And referee Dietz has given a corner kick. Big giant figure of Jack Charlton is moving up into the England box as his brother Bobby takes the kick. George Cohen couldn't get that one back again. This is held for Germany. And Haller. Emmerich making space down the left wing. That's Emmerich. Now held. Beckenbauer held Emmerich and the ball gets over there. Well, defensively, I don't think anybody could halt Alan Ball in the game as a forward, but what a lot of graft he gets through in defence. Bobby Chard. Hunt. Hunt. Good ball for Ball. Low. And Tilkowski had to put that away for a corner. Undoubtedly, when England dart in behind this defensive wall of Germany, they're getting them in trouble. Alan Ball with a corner for England. First. Well, at 2-1, 78 minutes to Jeff Hurst. You must have all been thinking, this is it now. We've got to hang on just over 10 minutes and we're world champions. Yes, it's Martin Peters, as usual. He's in the box waiting for something to happen. I take the shot, deflection comes off the German player. Martin's 10 yards out. And as usual, his record international level, uh, the amount of goals he scored, I think 67 games, uh, 20 goals for England. 
was absolutely fantastic. And at that stage, you think the, the game's got to be over and we, we're going to win it. And from what you've been seeing, Glenn, the build-up to that goal, would you have also put money on the fact that England could have shut them down and, and kept the scoreline at 2-1? Have you been there on the day? Oh, I think so. Yeah, we'd have been hoping for... Well, I was a kid, I was hoping for that, you know. We were elated, and, uh, as the whole country was. But, yeah, I think, you know... <sighs> In this second half, it's been a tight game. It's not been much in it, but there were, you know, Germany, the West Germans weren't really creating that much. So I would have, I would have been looking at that and say, yeah, we can see this game off now. But obviously, we know what happens um, coming up in the last minute <laughs> of the game. But um, it's amazing now. Sometimes you look at things, and, and, and you know, the modern day, there's things that people would have done to sort of waste some time, maybe going into the last minutes, taking it and staying into a corner flag. Uh, it just wasn't done back in '66, and uh, in many ways it was quite refreshing. But uh, no, it was from here you, you expect England to go on and win the game, don't you? Let's get back to the action and time to hear from the BBC commentary team of Wally Barnes and Kenneth Wollstoneholm. Well, the crowd will, willing to cheer anything. All smiles in the royal box. Now, well, here comes Peters, and England really on top now. Through to Charlton, number nine. Bobby Charlton hasn't got one on target yet. Ten minutes left. Well, can England now hold on to this 2-1 lead? Number six, Weber. Germans tired, leg weary. Significant now that no one is coming back to challenge. Schultz to put gaze. Now Schultz. There's more telling him to calm down, don't be in too much of a hurry. It's in play. Ball. To Hurst. Up comes Charlton on Hurst's left. There's Jeff Hurst. Well, he missed the target, but nevertheless, the ball. Went up onto the Greyhound track and the England supporters then know that that gets a few precious seconds for England. Eight minutes to go. England lead 2-1. First time the Germans have conceded two goals in a World Cup match. Well, the crowd didn't like that bit of time wasting by England. You can hear what the crowd won. We want three, not passes back to the goalkeeper. Here comes ball. Now Peters moving forward. Here comes Peters. Seven minutes left. Two one for England.
the tension now becoming unbearable. A foul by Charlton on Emery. As Ubezela, I think he's sensing now that his team has run out of steam. Uh, running with nothing like the confidence that they were earlier in the match. Out of play throw to West Germany. England team. Superbly fit rule Britannia now being sung by the crowd. Help. is held and it's a free kick Styles fouled him free kick to West Germany is it going to be a shot by Emmerich or a floated one for Sailor to come come in try and head it number six Faber has gone up and well, you can see the shot he's got oh, that was Faber Telling them to calm down, and the referee going to have a word with Banks about wasting time. Five minutes then left for play. Free kick to West Germany, an indirect free kick for dangerous play. Is Bobby Moore going back to? Arrange the defence. England lead 2-1. 2-1 deep into the second half. Uh, where better then to be joined by Roy Hodgson, former England manager, Crystal Palace manager, of course. And when this match is being played, Roy, you were just starting your life out as a young footballer at Crystal Palace. What are your memories of this World Cup final? Yeah, I remember it very well. Obviously, it's a, it was such a big occasion. We looked forward to it for a long while, followed the Follow the results, uh, all the matches of course played up to that point. It was a bit of a mixed bag, but uh, the one just before the semi final against Portugal was a very good game. I think everyone was really optimistic that we were going to carry that form into the final and win it comfortably. But uh, as we know now, it wasn't a, it wasn't comfortable because it went to extra time and it took a somewhat controversial goal to seal it. But it was still a wonderful performance and a great day for all of us young footballers dreaming of a a footballing future, watching watching your heroes win the World Cup. Yeah, it must have been so exciting to be a young footballer on the precipice of your career when England win a World Cup. You know, it just must have felt like anything was was possible. And as we've we've discussed with Greg Dyke, I guess there was an expectation they could go on and do it again and again and again. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, obviously, it's hard to think back to that time. I mean, I don't think we really consider that. I remember the 1970 World Cup finals and I really did think that we were going to do very well in that competition because the team was still very much, uh, the basis of the team was still there and one or two other players had come forward and I thought we looked very strong and I remember when we eventually lost that game, 2-0 up at half time and, and, and Alf decided to make a couple of substitutions and they called Bobby Charlton and I think it was with Martin Peters, the other one he took off. He took off two players anyway at half time to spare them, if you like, for the for the next round. And suddenly Germany came back in it, and uh, we ended up unfortunately going out of the competition. It was a big surprise, I think, just at the time because we were so confident. Mm. Did you ever get the chance, as a, as a connoisseur of football and a student of the game, to pick the brains of Sir Alf Ramsey? No, not really. I was, I suppose I can boast that I met him and sat on the same table. It was a, uh, Reg Drury had invited me to the annual journalist conference when uh, he, he knew Alf well and had invited Alf to be on the table as well. So it was a great honour to be there. It was nice to be in his company, but I, I think it would be a bit stronger. So I picked his brains. I'm, I'm certain we exchanged a few words, but that was about <laughs> 
And finally, Roy, nearly, so nearly getting back to Premier League football, not long now. How has life in lockdown been for you? It's been OK. I mean, I think we've, we've dealt with it like everybody else, made the best of it and tried to make certain that we keep fit and keep optimistic, really. And I, I think the optimism has paid off now. But it does look as though we didn't get those last nine matches played and certainly the last 10 or 12 days we've actually been able to train again and meet the players. That's, that's really seemed to have made all the efforts of lockdown worthwhile. So it's all a question looking forward now and they're not thinking too much about the moments in the lockdown where life didn't seem quite as good because we were missing the football. Thank you so much for joining us and best of luck with your remaining games of the season, Roy. We have just seconds to go in this game. England, 2-1 up. Can they hold on? One minute to go, just 60 seconds. Every Englishman coming back, every German going forward. Now, will the Germans snatch a dramatic equaliser and bring us to extra time? It's Emmerich coming in. Well, you just couldn't write a script like this, could you, Jeff Hurst? And obviously, heartbreak for the players, knowing that literally all you had left to do was, was kick off before the final whistle was blown and extra time was upon you. What's going through your heads at, at this point? Well, it was a bit of blow because as he crosses it, it just catches Snellinger's left ar right arm, which slows it down for Weber, which enabled him to score the goal. And that's never been talked about. But um, it's a bit of blow to us. But quite frankly, kicking off again, Bobby Charlton looks absolutely sick, as you can see facially there. But with the hard-nosed professional boys um, and Alf's team talk, which is very important, brief team talk when we sat down, apart from talking individually, he said to uh, us, you've beaten the Germans once, go and beat them again. That line sticks with me forever. I'm getting quite emotional talking about it. I'm sure you are. And, I'm, you know, in thinking how, you know, the sliding doors of history, you know, it could have been Martin Peters who was the national hero that day. Somebody else, though, had to step up, didn't they, an extra time and be that person. And were it not for Weber, you wouldn't have had that opportunity. Absolutely. I mean, it's... Uh, and Martin was such a great player for West Ham in England, a great goal scorer. And to be honest with you, he sadly passed away, as you know, recently. It would have been great for me to have seen him score the winner and it wouldn't have taken anything away. The most important thing on the day that we, we won the game, however way we won it. Thank you so much. We've reached 90 minutes. It's two all between England and West Germany. We're about to go into extra time. So let's get some perspective right now, shall we, from the nation's favourite German, Jürgen Klinsmann, who can join us from California. Thank you so much for giving up your time, Jürgen. I think 30th of July is a very special date for you, but perhaps not the way people might be thinking. You were just two years old in 1966, so I imagine your memories are a little bit sketchy. Yeah, no, I had no memories, obviously. <laughs> Two years old, you don't get much uh, of the bigger picture. But uh, uh, obviously, years, years later, um, my, my dad explained everything to me, what uh, happened in 66 in the World Cup final with this very, very special game. It's been a, a thriller. Um, obviously, you know, uh, yeah, with an English side that was exceptional, um, playing at Wembley, you know, the, the, the final at home and... and uh, so there are a lot of memories also for the Germans with that game. Uh, a lot of discussions, obviously, about you know the the third goal. But but it's been a tremendous final, um, and and everyone probably in England keeps that uh, starting eleven. You know, has it inside out. You know, they can read it down even today. Uh, for us, also for Germans, it was an amazing team uh, with a lot of idols coming out, even if they lost the game. You know, there were players that left their mark, um, obviously, in that game. A very, very young Franz Beckenbauer who became one of the big, biggest players ever in the game. And my, my childhood hero, Uwe Seeler, who was the captain at that time, the center forward from uh, Hamburg, who played his whole career in Hamburg. I bought, I bought my first cleats, pair of cleats, was the Uwe Seeler cleats. So 
it's been a tremendous uh, uh, game, the 66 final that uh, obviously leaves us with a lot of, of good memories. It does, because England had never won another major trophy. And, you know, you were part of a German side that broke hearts in 96, another opportunity that English fans feel they, they squandered, you know. And that's, of course, when penalty shootouts started coming into the game. Well, that was a whole different story, wasn't it, between England and Germany. You must have tasted that that night, you know, the disappointment from England fans and, and sensed it around you. Yeah, definitely. You, you feel it and, and you feel for them as well because penalty shootouts are net. It's not fair. You know, it should have a, a winner in the regular time, in the extra time with one goal. And, and uh, if it was 90 or if it was then 96, you know, both sides had the chances to, to finish off the game before it went to these famous penalty shootouts. Um, but it's unfortunately that's just the way it, it goes. Um, you need that little bit of luck. Um, and, and maybe somebody special that, that decides a game on, it, on its own. Um, uh, but looking back, you know, ev everything happens in a specific moment of time. You know, when, when Germany won its first World Cup in 1954, so even 12 years before England won in 66, it was uh, the World Cup of a, um, uh, of, of a team, basically, that made, made Germany stand tall again after World War II, obviously. So from a social point of view, it's ex extremely, extremely important to, to the nation. And then the next one came in 74 when we had huge crisis, the, you know, the oil drama and, and the, 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 you know, the 72, the Olympics in, in, in Munich, you know, with, uh, with the shooting and with, with all these, these, these things happening around the world. So that was a specific moment in time too. When we won it in 1990 under Franz Beckenbauer, who played that 66 final, you know, and, and lost it. And, and then he obviously won it as a captain in 74. He guided us to win the World Cup in 90 with that famous semi-final with, with England. But it happened at, also at a time for Germany where it was the first time it was reunited after the wall came down in 89. So that meant the world to, the, to that nation, you know, that you won it for the entire Germany, not only for West Germany, even if it was only the team that represented West Germany at that time. But, but uh, um, so everything happens in a specific moment in time and, and, uh, and who knows what brings the future. Maybe the next World Cup that England wins will happen exactly at a moment where you think now it all, it all fits, it, all, it, it happens for a reason. So you're going to give hope to England football fans watching that their time will come again. Oh, definitely it will come again. There's no doubt about it. I think that's a good place to end. Thank you so much, Jürgen. Lovely to uh, relive a little bit of German football history with you. And uh, you can't help when you listen to you realise just, you know, how successful in comparison Germany have been in lifting trophies. But congratulations and we'll see you soon. See you soon. Thank you, Gabby. It's been a pleasure. Now, coming up, it's extra time from Wembley in the company of Sir Jeff Hurst and Glenn Hoddle. No golden goal, of course, but it was 30 minutes of football that would live long in the memory for English football fans. Taking us through extra time, it's Wally Barnes and Kenneth Wollstonehome. There's Bobby Charlton, picture of a serious man. We go 15 minutes each way. Styles has got stockings rolled down. There he is, right in the center of the picture. Ball has got stockings rolled down. This is always a sign crap creeping into the consideration. In comes Haller. Number eight, Helmut Haller. Never has a World Cup final produced such a finish. First time they've ever had to play extra time in the final. Here comes Schnellinger. Zeller. the ball as they're going to have to pace themselves in this extra time is that beauty that 
the best shot Alan Ball's put in since he's been an England player. And it was a pretty good save by Tukowski. Ball to take the corner. Uh, it's a free kick, I think. It's a free kick to foul by Cohen on Emmerich. Russell Linesman. And away goes Huller. And Schnelliger's in trouble. Schnelliger can hardly move this. Schnellinger, but it's Beckenbauer with the ball. Held to Emmerich. Ooh, I bet that hurt Cohen. Schnellinger's in trouble with that left foot. Over us. Here comes Bobby Charlton. And Brother Jack breaking on the left. Hurst has been a bundle of mischief in every high ball that's come across. Ball. Jack Charlton. Peters. Bobby Charlton. Oh! Hit the post. And it, the goalkeeper's taken another one in the mouth. That was the ball that hit him that time. This is Kelt. Emmerich. Wilson to Hunt. No, I don't think Tilkovsky had much chance with that one for Roger Hunt. And there's the German trainer just come behind the goal, I think, to see how Schneider is. Schneider seems to be all right now. There is the fair hair player in the picture, number three. Great end to a great competition this has been. What a kick to England. Jeff Hurst hasn't let the side down. But nobody has. Jackie Charlton beginning to lope up towards the penalty area. And the sun really shining now. Well, the sun's come out in extra time and the sunshine's coming to your screen now because I'm delighted to say Chris Kamara <laughs> can join us. <laughs> Chris, a lot of people will be amazed to hear that you were even alive in 1966. <laughs> <You're so beautiful. laughs> How were you? Where were you? Where did you watch it? <laughs> Thanks, Gabby. Uh, I was eight years old at the time. Uh, we didn't have a telly in those days. So I went round a friend's house, uh, a friend called Dennis Newsom. Uh, went round his house, he had a black and white telly, and I watched the game there. And you've got some memorabilia behind you there, some England memorabilia. Yeah. Was this a match that set your passion alight for England? Oh, well, it introduced me, not just to football on the television, to football, to live football. Middlesbrough uh, hosted North Korea. So North Korea played all their World Cup matches at Ayrson Park and they played Chile in the second game and nobody wanted to go. So I think there was only 10,000 tickets were sold. So they gave loads and loads of tickets away. So it was my first ever football match, a World Cup game. And so from then on, I was hooked. And so I had to see England. So I, I saw the semi-final against Portugal, Bobby Charlton's two goals, but Portugal and Eusebio were magnificent in that game. And then 
uh, obviously I watched the final and the final, well, I've, I, I keep the final because I watch it sneakily every now and then, Gabby, because it's such a wonderful game. It's a brilliant game. It's the quality of the football uh, is amazing. It's like we missed out in the 90s or 80s or whatever, because going back to 66, when you look at the, the way that they played, they pass the ball around at the back, the centre-halves get forward at every opportunity. In midfield, they play little short passes to each other. And then uh, the quality of the goals and, and the free kicks. Uh, well, you've had Jeff Hurst on and Bobby Moore was taking most of the free kicks and that equalising goal came from Bobby Moore to Jeff Hurst. So it's such a wonderful game. Yeah, Glenn Hoddle was saying Bobby Moore could play in any generation. He could be playing now, you know, the way he's playing out from the back. But interesting there that you've watched it so many times because so many people have never seen the game in its entirety. You know, they've seen the iconic moments, the clips, they know the commentary lines. But it feels to me like you are the absolutely perfect guest, perfectly positioned to, to say just how special this was and how it influenced you and, and your career. Oh, very much so. Start at the beginning. So they're in the Royal Box and they sing the National Anthem. So everybody who's in the Royal Box, the Queen is there. Don't sing the National Anthem. What's going on? The Queen is there, but whether the protocol was that they couldn't sing. So Stanley Rouse was sat next to the Queen or stood next to her when the National Anthem was on. And he was desperate to break into God Save Our Gracious Queen. But I presume he was told he couldn't say anything. <laughs> and what do you think if you were working on this match, Cammy? You know, and what would you think your line to Jeff back at the studio would be with the extra time goals? Uh, well, the extra time goals, they are unbelievable. They are fantastic. You know, they really are. You know, everyone talks about the, you know, was it over the line, was it over the line uh, goal all the time. But if you look at uh, Roger Hunt's position, uh, then you know exactly. Roger Hunt is a striker. He would have went and tried to score a goal. It's as simple as that. But immediately, as, as soon as that ball, in his opinion, crossed the line, he goes away to celebrate. He doesn't even think about trying to put the ball in the back of the net. So that's great. And then Alan Ball in extra time. Wow. He is the best. I know Jeff Hurst got a hat trick and he's probably listening, Jeff. And when you get a hat trick in a World Cup final, you deserve to be man of the match. There's no doubt about that. But Alan Ball, in extra time, head and shoulders above anybody else on that pitch. He was magnificent, ran himself into the ground, but was always available for anybody. And the quality of his football was brilliant. Cammy, I'm going to have to cut into you because, uh, oh, to, to use your words, something big's about to happen any moment now. But thank you so, so <laughs> much. It's been really wonderful hearing your enthusiasm for this match. Thanks for having me. Well, you see how long of extra time we've had. Two goals each. Just 20 minutes of the game left. Here's Ball running himself back. And now Hurst can do it. He has to yes. Yes. No. No Lionsman says no. The Lionsman says no. It's a goal. This line uh, at the linesman who can only speak Russian and Turkish. Well, we can see it back again. And uh, we certainly, Sir Jeff, we'd have certainly had to go to some kind of VAR, wouldn't we now, to get that decision sorted out? But look how quickly it got agreed and sorted on the pitch. <laughs> well, had they had VAR, it was shown quite categorically the ball was well over the line. Um, it's interesting, I played with Alan Ball under 23 level and he knew I liked the ball whipped into the near post. But from my angle and looking over my shoulder, I could not see where the ball landed because it, it bounced directly behind Tilkowski. But what Cammy said is quite right. 
Roger Hunt sit, turned away, shouted goal, signaled it was a goal, whereas any great striker as he is would have attempted to knock the ball in. And I've gone on that reaction as much as anything uh, since that time. It is interesting though, isn't it, Glenn, seeing the, the officials making that decision very quickly, making the right decision as well, uh, in something you know, so important, so pivotal. Yeah, it was. They, they were very positive. As soon as they went over to the linesman, you're thinking, oh no, this is going to go the wrong way for England. But uh, I, I want to know why he's wearing a white belt as well, uh, Gabby. If you look at that ever again, he's wearing <laughs> a white belt. I, I could never get that out of my head when I was a kid. But uh, fortunately, the decision went our way. Yeah, you know. But I thought, Jeff, the first touch, your touch and turn was, people don't talk about that. They're always talking about, is the ball over the line? But to actually, your first touch, you know, as that ball was coming, was excellent to get turned and get your shot in in the first place. But uh, I, I am really so pleased that, that you got the hat-trick. Obviously, you are having three goals because it just made it right. You know, we wouldn't have wanted to win 3-2 with a debatable goal. Thanks, guys. Let's get back to the action. And Wilson's on his feet. Beckenbauer. Trying over right. Here comes Hallow. Now Hilt. A great tackle by Peters. And Hilt fouling Peters. Nobby Styles know that thing. Look, when you get the ball, clear it. Charlton and Alan Ball still running. He'll be running half an hour after the finish, I think, Alan Ball. Snellinger. Oh, and here's Emmerich. See the pattern of the England defence now. The hell trying to go through the middle. It's a great save by the Here comes Mr. Perpetual Motion again. Style handball by Schnellinger. 97,000 referees gave that decision. One minute to the break in half time. Of a Charlton. have been over the line for a goal kick. Still, nobody worried about such niceties. It's a good ball from Haller to Held. He's got Zeller in the middle. They're going to do it. They must do it in 30 seconds. Emmerich. For the first time we've seen a glimpse of Emmerich's shooting power. There's Emmerich. Cohen. The other 20, two very tired men. But they certainly give given this crowd and 400 million television viewers a lot to talk about. And the whistle goes for the end of the first period of extra time. Hurst has now got two and Peter's one for England. Haller and Weber for West Germany. So half time in extra time, England leading 3-2. Could they hang on? We're heading back into the second period of extra time. England lead thanks to a goal from Martin Peters and two from 24-year-old Jeff Hurst, who might just have his eye on the match ball. Here we go then, England 15 minutes away from winning the World Cup. Away we go. Here comes Held. Emmerich. 
Telegram now over us. This is Emmerich. First the ball. Now to Hunt. Here comes ball. Because he run himself mad, this young fellow. And Wilson. Now Beckenbauer. was running on to that pass on Held. Now Beckenbauer. Some of the players now how they got strength to lift one leg after the other. Stirring performance by both teams. 21, Hunt. Bobby Charlton. Peters. Noticeably, but Beckham Bar still hasn't got back. He's just walking slowly in midfield. Well, Kenneth Wilstenholm there mentions Beckenbauer can hardly raise a job. He's so exhausted. What was it like, Sir Jeff? I mean, you've got the lead, so I guess, you know, the, the momentum is with you, but the exhaustion must be setting in after so many games in a short period of time, now in extra time and no subs, and, the, you know, no prospect of anybody relieving the pressure. No, it's, uh, there were a lot of tired uh, bodies on the field in that last uh, 10 or 15 minutes um, of extra time. You put those into context, the, the mood of the nation, playing at home, the pressure on wanting to be successful, playing against a great German side on heavy, heavy conditions, a really toto combat throughout the game. And, um, but my feeling was at this, this stage, I didn't think we were in danger of doing anything silly or giving it away with such a professional outfit as we had. such confidence as well and Glenn are you surprised we've talked a little bit about fitness and perhaps how surprisingly you know fit these players were considering that this was pre-sports science you know pre kind of you know the, the professional levels of fitness training we see today obviously that you know there were little added advantages being at home the Uruguayans had said they were surprised that England had silk shirts the players wore Vaseline on their eyebrows to stop sweat um, coming into their their faces and into their eyes all these little details yeah, I think it's, it's been amazing how fit both teams have, have, have had to play extra time in as well. I mean, it's been such an open game as from box to box. That's very difficult when you play with that open spaces like they have been. Uh, both sets of defenders really as start attacks from, from the penalty areas. So I've been astonished at the pace of the game, the way the pace of the game has, uh, has continued. But now this is a mental strength really now, Jeff, isn't it? You know, physically you're tired, but against the Germans, you, they've come back once and you're thinking, crikey, are they going to do it again? We've just got to make sure that we, uh, that we end up winning this game and uh, all the efforts that we put in. They'd have felt tired as well, they were chasing the game. So, uh, but I think, you know, that the, the play, some of the football has been excellent and some of the, the fitness shown has really astounded me. I've not seen the whole, uh, the whole game with extra time and I, I'm surprised at the pace of the game still. It's fascinating how open the game was and how, how different that would be with the situation today with players holding on to a lead and there was no, we're still attacking, you know, having lost it once. Thank you so much, Jeff and Glenn. We've just got 10 minutes left. What could happen? Let's find out. Emmerich has moved into the middle for Germany. This is Hell. Beckenbauer. Charlton, Costa, Styles, 
No ball was over this side a second or two ago. There he is now fuzzing on the other. And comes Styles. That jump now has taken the tapes from round his stockings. Roll his stockings down, he's limping. Now over out. Well, I'm delighted to say that Joe Brand is with us uh, for the next few minutes. Joe, you were nine years old in 1966. Uh, what do you remember of this final and where did you watch it? Well, I watched it at home um, because um, my I was the middle child of two brothers and they were both like massive football fans. So I was kind of forced to be a football fan and they made me become a West Ham fan. So obviously, I had a lot of interest in that World Cup final team, yeah. <laughs> you did, and they were instrumental in uh, helping ultimately to uh, lift the trophy. Was it the match then, you got the brothers who supported, but was it the match that gave you your own passion? Did you decide that you were actually a football fan after all? Was the hysteria enough to carry you along? Definitely. I mean, I think as, as a kind of eight, nine-year-old, I'd, I'd been forced to, for years, stand at the edge of football pitches and watch my brothers getting, you know, layers of mud on them, because that's what football was like in those days. So um, I did like football <laughs> already before then, but I've, obviously it had never occurred to me that England would ever win the World Cup, and that made a huge difference. Plus, I think as a nine-year-old, I was also kind of fairly in love with Bobby Moore as well, as was every girl under the age of 12, I would have thought at the time. I think it's, it's interesting watching this match in its entirety. I mean, I'm amazed at the fitness levels. We're deep into um, extra time. England are obviously uh, winning with minutes to go and they're still playing end to end with no subs. You know, there's no going off to relieve the pressure and get somebody else to take over for 10 minutes at the end of the game. Do you think when you look back now, how much football has changed in that period of time? Because you've been a regular watcher and purveyor of Premier League football. Well, yeah, it's changed enormously. I mean, I think the other thing to be very impressed by is that at that point, you know, in, in the 60s when they were playing football, they were all clubbing the night before. They were all having like 60 fags a day and drinking because there was none of this, you know, <laughs> don't eat carbs rubbish. It was all do what you want and just play well. So um, it's even more impressive in a way. Um, there was no sort of psychology really applied and what was applied was amateur. And so I think the game has changed beyond belief. And also like the money element is just so, um, you know, so different these days. And I think has made the game much uh, less working class than it used to be, if you like. Yeah, it's interesting. The crowd shots are so brilliant, especially the colour ones, where men were coming to the match wearing suit and tie. You know, the regular fans coming at Wembley Way, not people going to hospitality boxes, because it was a real occasion to come to this World Cup final, obviously. But since then, no major trophies. So was there an expectation, do you think, in 66? Well, this is, you know, we can win World Cups. This is something that England will carry on doing. 
almost it was you know it was quite easy yeah absolutely just briefly on the crowds you know that women had to stay outside and make a pie don't you they weren't allowed in uh then and now we are obviously <laughs> so and that's a good thing um but i think expectations were really high after after the world cup yeah and that's why as every world cup passes us we, we get more and more disappointed every time and sometimes it comes very close and it's just out of our grasp and that that results in a huge plunge into depression for football fans but um i don't know we just have to keep going we do and of course the world cups are now so much bigger so many more teams you know the standard across the world is is so much greater isn't it but um it's been wonderful uh, reliving with you some of your memories from 66 thank you so much joe and uh, enjoy uh, the rest of this match because I, I feel it's coming to a dramatic conclusion absolutely then i'm off to have a kick about Three minutes left. Peters, ball on the left wing. Charlton, his ball. Good play by it, over out. Zayner, Haller going down the middle. Zayner never saw him, it's Schnellinger now. Think of the NAD over has got to waste to chase that one. Germany now gonna pull England out. That's a headache for more in the morning. Over right to Schnellinger. This is held. This has been a great game for Germany, but that was Hunt coming back to challenge. Here's Help taking the throw in. Haller. Ball on the left wing, here's Ball. Peters up there with him, going on the left. seconds left for play here's Schultz Schnellinger is looking as if he can't move another inch because Halland is there back to Schultz sends a run from Conan this should be the last gas one minute to go everyone's got to come up for this one for Germany Halland is the referee looks at his watch any second now it will all be over 30 seconds by our watch and the Germans are going down and they can hardly get up it's all over I think no it's and here comes Hurst he's got some people are on the pitch they think it's all over it is now it's four It is all over. England are the world champions. The crowd are on the pitch now, but who cares? This is the greatest moment in the history of English football. One of the great moments in sports for any English football fan, certainly the greatest, but one of the most 
fantastic commentary lines ever delivered in sport. Uh, Barry Davis said it earlier, didn't he, Jeff Hurst, that uh, the greatest line was delivered that day. And that moment for you, it was all over, but it had just begun as a, a World Cup winner. What was that like? Well, I remember every, everything I was thinking as I was about to, to shoot. I'd seen the referee wave him to play on with the whistle in the mouth and both arms. And I got to the edge of the box and my thoughts were just as clear as they were then. I'm tired. I know the game is now over. I'm now going to whack this ball with everything I've got left. If it went over the bar into the crowd, it didn't really matter. Because as you all know, I miss hit it and it, it flew in. In those few minutes between the final whistle, 4-2 winners over West Germany in that final and the moments of going up to collect the trophy, What's happening? What's going through your mind? I mean, did you have a chance to spot people who'd come to watch you in the crowd, for example? No, the first emotion, I've been asked this many times, the first emotion when the whistle goes and the game is over is a one and a huge sense of relief that you got through the tournament in 20 days, all the important games, and particularly the final, of course, under, under two hours. It's just a huge sense of relief you've got through it. After that, you, you, your mind becomes a, quite a bit of a blur. Well, steady yourself and you might need a, a box of uh, tissues nearby because we're about to relive uh, one of the great moments, the trophy presentation. Enjoy this, Sir Jeff. And there's Jeff Hurst, the first man to get three goals in a World Cup match in this series. One man has not come off the pitch. Alf Ramsey, the man who schemed all this, is still as calm and as cool as ever. He is still standing in the position he's held all the match. The reserves are on, there's George Easton, there's Jimmy Armfield, there's John Kennelly. This great moment in English sporting history as Bobby Moore goes up to get the World Cup. Alf Ramsey walking forward to shake his hand. There is Alf Ramsey, the first sign of emotion from this man who has organised this victory. Up goes, but there's Bobby Stiles. Well, he can be Prime Minister in anything he likes now. There it is, all the fuss has been about. And Bobby Moore comes up to receive the Jules Rimet Trophy for England. Madness to the Queen. It's only 12 inches high, solid gold, and it means England are the world champions. There's Sid Collins, a happy man, chairman of the International Committee. And here's the three gold star, Jeff Hurst, and Bobby Charlton weeping with emotion. What? Roger Hunt, Martin Peters, Jackie Charlton, Ray Wilson, Alan Ball, George Cohen, Nobby Styles, and Gordon Banks. This great moment. Amazing scenes, and Sir Jeff, to see them in colour as well is, is so special, and to see there Bobby Moore being handed the jewels remade by the Queen, looking amazing in yellow as well. It's all so vivid now, isn't it? Does it, does it bring back the emotions for you very easily? Are they just underneath the surface? Oh, every day, every day. You'll never forget it, it's, it's amazing. What, what amuses me with Moro, immaculate as ever, always very tidy. He had the forethought, as you notice, to wipe his hands on the ledge because they were dirty, so he didn't get mud on the Queen's gloves. Even in, the, in that height, as calm and as immaculate and as smooth as ever. Just as typical Moro. Yeah, that is the sign of kind of somebody who is very much in the moment, isn't it? And that calmness and assuredness that I know, Glenn, you've just been mesmerised by throughout the match today. You know, you think you remember somebody's performances, but you've been absolutely blown away by the captain. He's, he was incredible, he really is. We all know what a great player he was and we go with what Jeff says, he's played with him so many years. But just watching that game, he was, he was just, he was playing in a different era. To me, he looked like he was, he, he, his mind was thinking quicker than anyone. 
He read the game. I don't think. I think he gave two two passes away in the whole of the match and the extra time. And, and what a captain of a fantastic team. And it's been an honour, a real honour, to share this with Jeff today. It really has. And uh, you're seeing the. Um, the sights now of all the fans. And I remember getting the banner out and going through the streets. And uh, it was a wonderful time, even as a young kid. It was great. And we heard a little bit earlier Barry Davis saying that at the function afterwards, the wives and girlfriends weren't invited, Jeff. So um, how did that go down? Not very well in our house, as you can imagine. And my wife still reminds me uh, 50 odd years <laughs> ago. <laughs> um, but it was such a boring banquet. The wives not invited. So we did something afterwards. I went to Daniel Roos Club with a few of the players, Alan Ball, Nobby Styles, John Connelly. Martin was invited, but decided to stay. Hadn't seen his wife, obviously, for four or five weeks. Decided to stay, stay back in the hotel. But a great night, and I've got great photographic memories of it. I'm sure you have, and I'm sure you've celebrated many, many times since and been reminded of just how special that moment is in, in British sporting history. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your time with us today and to reliving some of those memories for us. And I know, Glenn, you've, you've loved it as well, haven't you? So thank you. Certainly have. It's been an honour. <laughs>